about time to get started. Um, thanks for being with us today. I'm Cliff Lynch. I'm the director of the Coalition for Networked Information. And you've joined us for one of the project briefing sessions on the third day of week two of our um, CNI uh, fall 2020 virtual member meeting. And uh, just as a reminder, um, the themes of week two are around the transformation of organizations and professions, um, which of course gets deeply into topics also of teaching and learning. Uh, this is um, very much in keeping with all of those themes. A few mechanical things. Uh, we are recording this session. The recording will be available later. Um, there is closed captioning available if you'd like to turn that on. There is a chat box. Feel free to use that for comments or to introduce yourself um, during the session. And uh, at the end of our presentations, Diane Goldenberg Hart from CNI will moderate a question and answer session. There's a Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen, and you can use that to answer to, to enter questions at any time. We will uh, collect those up and uh, try and respond to them during the question and answer session. And with that, I want to just introduce this presentation and our two speakers. Um, I um, am happy that uh, Aaron Tripp, the um, Director of Research and Innovation at Lyricis, is with us. And um, she is going to be um, working with Tony Zanders. Um, Tony is an old friend of the coalitions. Uh, many of you will remember him from uh, previous years when he uh, attended, for example, representing Ex Libris. In uh, 2018, uh, he set out on his own to found a company um, of which he is CEO called Skill Type, which he will tell us a bit about. And um, really, what the session is about is taking a look at how to do professional development in scholarly settings more effectively, more agilely, and more responsively. And uh, with that, I will pass it over to Aaron um, to begin the presentation. And let me just thank both of our presenters for joining us and doing this. Over to you, Aaron. Thank you, Cliff. And welcome everyone. Um, this session is titled Modernizing Scholarly Professional Development with Ally and AI. Um, we're so happy that you can be here. My name is Erin Tripp. Thank you, Cliff, for the introduction. Um, I'm the Director of Research and Innovation at Lyricis, and I'm joining from Moncton, New Brunswick in Canada. Um, I'd also like to introduce a colleague who isn't here today, but her name is Annie Peterson, and she helped a lot with this presentation, and she's located in Durham, North Carolina. And Tony, do you Hi. want to introduce yourself? Of course. Hey, everyone. I'm Tony Zanders. I'm the founder and CEO of SkillType. Uh, and I'm beaming in from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Good to see everyone. Great, and if anyone wants to share where they're joining from in the chat, we'd be uh, delighted to see where you're joining from or beaming in from today. So um, just a note on conduct. In this virtual space, we'll strive to engage in respectful discussion, ask questions and seek clarification and be receptive to feedback. Uh, we also want to follow the CNI code of conduct, which I'm going to drop into the chat right now. And thanks, Clem and Carl, for, for letting us know where you're joining from Honolulu and Albuquerque. Great to Wonderful. see you here. Great. Some context for today's talk. Um, has to do with how we have conducted professional development in the scholarly field um, to date. Um, some highlights of things that we're all aware of, um, but just again, to give you context, we're, we're now aware of um, the limitations of, of traveling to conferences, uh, even before COVID when we were able to, um, it was expensive and not always possible. And only a select group of us had the fortune and, 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 and um, benefit to be able to fly to events to receive uh, these quality training opportunities. Um, budget cuts, 
Hiring freezes, austerity measures are, are going to continue. Um, and it really adds more uh, of a limitation on these traditional opportunities for, to grow and advance our careers. Um, the last bullet here dealing with training focused on individuals instead of all employees. It's something that we've been aware of, but I, I haven't seen much of a dialogue on the root cause this plays when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion issues. There's a, there's a dialogue between the, the model, the traditional model for professional development and whether or not that exacerbates some of the DEI related issues that we're seeking to solve. In the next slide, I'll show you an illustration of, of sort of what this looks like. And so um, one of the problems that we identified early in our, our days doing research for skill type is that professional development is by and large an, an independent activity. Um, uh, the current infrastructure requires librarians and our, our colleagues to navigate this career pathway uh, process and this professional development alone. Um, and so what you're looking at here is a, is a diagram of a couple different options that we've all benefited from. Maybe you have a, a really good manager uh, and that manager is facilitating your professional development. There's a, a pretty active dialogue they have with you in your growth in the organization, but not everyone. Um, maybe you have peers. Uh, you are a member of a, of a cohort of peer colleagues who can recommend what trainings and what steps you should take to advance your career. Um, but again, Everyone doesn't have that peer set. If you were not, uh, you know, membership in, uh, say, an ARL fellows program or some other type of fellowship, maybe you don't have that peer network. But even in the best case, if you have a really good manager and you have the peer set as well, you're still left to navigate a, a, a very large amount of opportunities that are coming from myriad sources, thousands around the world, um, to understand what is the needle in the haystack? Um, and you're, you're left pretty much on your own devices to figure that out and to carve out um, the proper steps to, to grow and advance your career. And so this is what we've observed um, in terms of professional development traditionally uh, being structured more like an independent study. And so since March 2020, we've witnessed some really tangible and encouraging moves towards professional development becoming more inclusive. Um, without the traditional barriers in our way, more people can participate. It's as simple as that. And I feel like we could call this a silver lining of the pandemic. Um, the question is, and do we feel like these reduction or this reduction of barriers will lead to career advancement opportunities for more people? Is this a situation where a more diverse and inclusive um, atmosphere will lead to tenure and promotion requirements being met for more people? We think that it will. Um, and that's not to say that we don't have more to do to make professional development more inclusive. It's a start. We certainly have gains to make in using assistive technologies for accessibility in virtual professional development um, and other steps as well. And so in this presentation, we wanna walk you some, through some of the process that we're going through um, to create a more inclusive experience in professional development, um, specifically on the two projects that we're working on. But before we get into it, um, we wanna ask you a question. So I have a quick poll and I'll put a link in the chat, but how has your professional development changed since March, 2020? Has it increased, stayed the same, decreased? Um, anecdotally, I'm hearing from a lot of folks that it's increased dramatically, but that may not be the same across. And we'll actually revisit the results at the end of the presentation. So I wanna talk a little bit about um, Lyricist Learning. And it's a program that I'm involved in. Um, so training programs are very common and very popular in our field. Um, they're often grant funded. And so Lyricis had a very long history of delivering training in the field. And in 2018, um, the training programs were reviewed with a fine tooth comb, let's say. And it revealed that the training programs were on a really unsustainable path. And I think a lot of grant funded training 
is on the same level. Um, expenditures often in, um, are often higher than what's coming in to support the program long term. So this review, it found that revenue had been down um, for three years or more. That training really was focused on individuals and Tony talked about some of the, the problems with that. So we weren't really talking about training teams or organizations. And it was really difficult to track and promote training as a whole. So if we were talking about transforming an organization or transforming a team, what we were delivering really wasn't landing. It wasn't resulting in what people or members needed it to result in. And so the review led to this brainstorming process and business planning process and eventually a pilot. And so in March, 2018, we piloted this new service, new program called Lyricist Learning. And the crux of it was that we wanted to offer a subscription model, which was not the norm and still is not the norm, but it's intended to level the playing field so that you can offer all training on any topic to any staff member. So that there isn't one or two people allowed to attend a class for 150 bucks a pop or $75 a pop that you would budget annually for training for all of your staff on all of the topics that they might need to transform their team, transform their position or respond to a new need or requirement. And it's really evolved since that pilot launched a little under three years ago. Um, we now roughly deliver 75 live classes a year, around 1,500 participants, and we've, build, uh, we've built a learning library with around 300 recording, recorded classes in it. So the content is growing, the, um, the subject matter is becoming more wide, and we're really just starting to hit our stride now with leveling the, pro, the the playing field in delivering professional development to members. Around the same time, the folks at Lyricis must have been drinking the same water that we were. Uh, and we were thinking along the same terms, but coming at the same problem from two completely different angles. And so I want to walk you through a timeline of the skill type project, um, which um, October 2018, we, we came up with a, a, a name for this for this project and had relationships that we called development partnerships with about nine academic libraries who were funding the research and development for a software platform that could solve a lot of the issues that we were, we were facing. Essentially, we built a talent marketplace for library professionals and their teams to analyze the expertise that they had in-house. And once they analyzed that expertise, they could then have data to support where their professional development investments could go. And so that cycle of analysis and then developing expertise um, was sort of uh, the approach we settled on. You fast forward um, a couple of years of doing that work together and we had a partnership with Lyricist that um, came out of a, a couple conversations, uh, some folks who are very uh, uh, sort of uh, household names in the, in the CNI community actually introduced us to Robert Miller at Lyricist. Um, this was uh, Rob Cardellano at Columbia was one, uh, Tim McGeary at Duke uh, had both, um, said that we should probably consider looking into Lyricist talking with them. They have a lot of similar philosophies to how you're approaching learning and development. And those conversations matured over the summer in 2020, uh, leading up to a formal partnership uh, for Lyricist to become our fiscal agent uh, and distribute our software to the library community, but also to integrate with the Lyricist learning platform that Aaron described earlier. And so today we find ourselves in November um, starting to focus on the body of content and training that's available inside of the platform uh, to complement the set of tools we've built to analyze expertise inside of your organization. And so now organizations can develop a sense of what skills they have in the team, what everyone is interested in learning. And we're coupling those insights with um, an aggregation of, of trainings and, and content, starting with the Lyricist Learning Platform. 
So a few key themes um, on the approach that we're taking on the first challenge that we're solving through this approach is discoverability. Um, there's no shortage of training and professional development globally. Uh, in fact, more is being created now than ever. The challenge becomes putting this all into one place. Um, the irony of us having this conversation is that we've, we've solved this issue. Uh, I think we've solved it. Uh, some would debate that for patrons and researchers uh, seeking to get access to scholarly resources through discovery solutions. We've been working on these as an industry for over 10 years, maybe 12 years now. But the irony is that we haven't tackled this for ourselves as professionals seeking to grow our skills. Um, and so that's the irony of the discoverability conversation. Number two, the second challenge that we hope to tackle, as Erin alluded to, is affordability. Uh, most professional development is only available to paying customers or registrants. And this, we believe, is exacerbating diversity, equity, and inclusion issues. When out of the other side of our organization, we are launching strategic initiatives and investments to solve DEI-related issues. And so we think that there's uh, some opportunity for us to grow um, here. And um, I'll note too on, on discoverability, it's interesting because I actually heard from Annie Peterson earlier today that she got lyricist learning content in skill type today. Um, and so th that, was, that was wonderful because you really, it, there is a struggle getting the right training in front of the right people to let them know that it exists, um, to create an awareness of it and, and get to get the right people in the seats of that class or get the, the right people with eyes on that module. And so um, the, the distribution and discoverability benefits of a platform are really tangible. Um, in terms of uh, affordability and accessibility, I'm actually gonna couple these themes in my comments because um, you know, we want, we want training to be affordable. We also want it to be accessible. And in order to be accessible, we incur expenses that we need to cover through some method. And so we've been working really hard on making our content more accessible and exploring services that will make um, content accessible on a go forward basis, but also looking back at all of the content in our learning library. So 300 recordings, all of the slides and handouts that go along with those classes. How do we make those, how do we accurately caption those? And I'm going to say accurately and underline that, um, but also make all of those materials um, readable to buy a screen reader, for example. And so we've been looking into services that could help us make these steps in our service and um, meet the goals that we feel really strongly about in terms of accessibility. And our research came up with an estimate, an estimated cost of around $200,000 to accurately caption audio presentations and make slides and um, handouts um, accessible to screen readers. And so it was a big realization moment for us. Um, we knew that we needed to do a tiered implementation of our accessibility measures that we really want to implement. And we also knew that we needed to focus on awareness and education for anyone who is creating content. So we all create content that we present online, like the presentation that we're giving right now. It's not just informal presentations or former formal pr uh, professional development or pedagogy, but we decided that we would focus on Accessibility standards for instructors. So when you're creating a slide deck, you have to do these things to ensure that they are um, compliant with certain, um, with certain standards. And that we would actually have planned budgeting or planned spending to address the content that we already have in the learning library so that we will gradually make that content more accessible starting with the most popular content. Um, now, the program leader for Lyricist Learning, her name's Annie Peterson, I mentioned her off the top, she drafted a three-year plan, and the wonderful thing about it is that she has been leading this initiative, and now it is being used by other programs in our nonprofit around Lyricist. So, for example, um, an instructor guide that she's created for instructors of Lyricist Learning classes is now being used 
um, when we invite people to speak at a forum or a summit. And so we're seeing a trickle effect where the accessibility work that we're doing in Lyricist Learning is impacting other programs and other services in the organization. Um, I have one more. I have one more comment on accessibility too, sure. Erin. Um, because the University of Cincinnati, who is one of our development partners, um, provided a, a big service to us and I would say the larger community uh, by using their accessibility lab. They have a world class lab, um, not inside of the library, but at the university level. And as we were forming a partnership with them, one of the requirements was for us to develop uh, a VPAT, um, which measures, it's a voluntary um, um, document you create to measure your compliance with WCAG. And this was an exciting initiative for us to comply uh, with WCAG uh, single A for now, um, because in our aggregation of trainings from around the web, we're often working with Drupal websites or WordPress websites, uh, oftentimes that aren't accessible. And as we're bringing this material into, um, into skill type, these conversations that Erin and Annie and her team at Lyricist are having are being coupled with the conversations that are also being had inside of academic libraries. Um, but we're focused on this, this on, on professional development um, and so it's, it's sort of an exciting intersection from different groups in our community. Thanks, Tony. And so just to put a fine point on what skill type has become today, because it has evolved in response to COVID and in response to feedback we received from our community. As I mentioned, it's a software platform. Uh, so we're not a content provider. We're not producing training, but the software is a three-sided marketplace. It's specifically for us as information professionals and our organizations. And the functions inside of the marketplace are analyzing expertise. So what is it that we know how to do or want to learn how to do? And the developing expertise, growing that and then sharing it with organizations that matter. Um, and so the first column you'll see here is skill type for professionals, which is a, a free application available for anyone to become lifelong learners. Skill type for teams is how we earn revenue, which is a talent management offering for organizations who wish to manage that expertise data across their organization. And lastly, skill type for training providers, which is for conference organizers, professional associations, commercial vendors or nonprofit vendors who are producing training. Where's this headed into the future as we wrap up? We're developing as a community new infrastructure for professional development and training. This is responding to the move that experts are suggesting is the greatest reskilling initiative that the world has ever seen. People are investing billions of dollars in other industries into reskilling initiatives, but as the library and information science community, we haven't yet developed a cohesive response. We're hoping that this new set of tools are able to help all of our organizations have a modern dialogue um, around this. And so I wanna walk through the diagram in the final seconds here to show if we have a new model for considering a learner and all of the different inputs that are coming for a professional to guide their development, software can help facilitate this. Um, and in the diagram you see here, we have training providers that are pushing recommended content to me based on what I'm interested in learning from Lyricist Learning. I also get feedback from my managers, from my supervisor, from my employer who have the context of my nine to five job, of the skills I need to do that job. And then thirdly, there is community input because there are peers that are from other organizations who are in my line of work and they too are walking through the same process and can provide recommendations. So we need a more multifaceted approach to facilitate what, what modern professional development can look like. And we'd like to thank you for your, your attention today and hope we can start a dialogue around these, these topics. Thanks, Tony. 
And I mean, this this week's theme of the CNI presentation uh, presentations rather, it's about um, transforming organizations. And so the main question that we want to ask is, you know, what we're talking about, do you actually feel like it has the potential to transform an organization? Do you feel like it has the potential to transform your team or the work your team is doing? So that's that's the question I throw out to all of you who are in attendance. So drop in the chat if, if you have any comments about what you think the potential is of professional development moving online and some of the things that we're talking about. In the interim, I just wanted to take a quick look at the results of the poll. So 44% um, of respondents said that their professional development has increased since the pandemic, uh, since things closed down in March 2020. 33% uh, say that it's decreased and 22% says uh, say that it stayed the same. Yeah, the decrease uh, makes sense um, just because of the time we're in, uh, budgets are being cut. And we, we do hear that a, a, good, a good bit. Um, I wondered too, if that was just time. I'm hearing a lot from people that um, yeah. the volume of work has increased so much that um, there's less time also. Mm -hmm. So we have a question from Andrew, um, Tony, and it's, I'm not entirely clear on what the business model is. Can you explain? Hey, Andrew. Yep. Thanks for that. Just to clarify. Um, so Lyricist Learning has its own business model. Skill Type has its own. I could kind of walk you through both. Um, so Skill Type's a software platform. And while it's free to any individual to use, um, organizations pay an annual subscription to a, a software as a service experience. Um, training providers um, who are producing training can load their content into skill type uh, and get access to tools to manage that content. Um, that is a paid service for training providers as well to um, distribute uh, their trainings to measure the performance of those trainings, uh, to get analytics on who's using the training, so on and so forth. Um, Lyricist Learning is a um, subscription offering that Erin could speak more about, but um, that basically um, a, a member of Lyricist can pay to access that, that database of content uh, uh, from, from Lyricist um, directly. And so we have mutual customers that uh, subscribe to our software, but are also subscribing to that that content offering inside of the software. Yeah, we have, I mean, the subscription model is the unique thing that, um, so some of our members subscribe to Lyricist Learning for training, annual training across the board to anyone of, of any topic, uh, for any individual in their in institution, but people also pay per class too. Um, so we, we do have different models. Um, I think that there's a really powerful connection between Lyricist Learning and Skill Type for subscribers of both services, um, where you're really, um, I, I think that there's something really special. I, I know that that's what Rob Cardellano was talking about. He was like, if you could connect these two services, I think, I feel like it could have a, a tremendous impact on the people who are trying to access relevant, timely professional development for our field. Yeah, and it, it opened our eyes to a, a new opportunity uh, as an industry um, because, again, getting back to the equity issue, anytime the business model for professional development only allows one or a few people to receive that training inside of the whole organization, we're inadvertently um, increasing the, the problem around, around equity and diversity and inclusion in the organization. And so what Lyricist's approach to a subscription model for the professional development opened our eyes to was when we're talking to a training provider, we're encouraging them to rethink their business model from charging for one person to get access to, to everyone with the hope that in the short term, you may experience a, a loss in, in revenue from that particular institution because you're giving access to more people for less money. But by creating a global set of infrastructure, you're going to get more learners from around the world. 
Um, and so we, we already have uh, people um, subscribing um, and learning on skill type from places like Singapore, Australia, the UK, uh, Germany. Um, we're now in a relationship with uh, the Library Association of, of, of Singapore. We're working on something with IFLA that's gonna be announced soon. And so by, by sort of making the world a bit smaller, um, we're hoping we can increase revenues for mom and pop training providers because um, we understand these are not large businesses that are that are doing this great work. Um, and so that's that's sort of the, the, the approach we're taking. And I want to read out a couple comments in the chat. Um, so um, Clem has said, I think time is one issue. So I think we're talking about the poll here and how um, some people reported a decrease in professional development. So I think time is one issue, but funding is definitely an issue. I won't know what my current year budget is until January. Hard to plan on what, if anything, you can spend. I know that the budgeting process has been harrowing, I think is, is the right word to use. Um, so thanks, Clem, for sharing that. Um, another comment from Cliff, um, I'll note that many of our members are reporting a huge increase in demand for research and technology upskilling by faculty and students since the pandemic started. Yeah, we're hearing that. Yep, this maps to the usage data we've seen as well. Uh, we take a look at what are sort of the most popular interests um, and that dictates the training and professional development we go out to get. Um, research data management's right at the top. Um, we now have about uh, 800 videos and articles on that topic alone. Um, and so that we've, we've seen a uh, response to that as well. Um, just thinking about Clem's comment um, about the unpredictability of the budgets, I think this is one of the strengths of subscriptions in general is the predictability of them as opposed to the sort of up and down nature of one-off, um, you know, uh, registration costs, or you know, figuring out what bundling model the conference will launch this time. Uh, you know, Charleston just bundled some things together to allow a group of people to save money. So, but those are a bit less predictable, um, and so we think sort of all-in subscriptions do have a, a, a benefit of that that sort of predictability. Yeah, it's interesting too. We were talking, I was talking with some colleagues this morning about the threshold um, for when subscription is saving you money. And I think it's first, because we have different tiers for the different size of institutions, like for our different membership tiers. And so I think for at least one tier, if you were taking, if, you, if anyone in your institution was taking three or more classes, so three or more classes per institution or organization, the subscription would actually save you money. And so um, that, that was an interesting aha moment, uh, I think for us. Um, I, I wanna read out another comment. Cecilia is saying, I think librarians have kept up or increased their professional development and those who are not in professional positions are somewhat reluctantly upskilling because they don't have enough work to keep them occupied. The mindset for professional development is just different between the two groups in, at my institution anyway. So I think a culture shift will have to happen as well. Thank you, Cecilia, for sharing that. Indeed. Um, and with those words, <laughs> that's a great place, I think, for us to um, bring this session to a close, and which I'm very sorry to do because I think it's been just a um, really interesting um, food for thought and such a wonderful conversation. I want to thank Aaron and Tony so much for bringing this issue to CNI and to our wonderful attendees for all their thoughtful comments and questions. Um, and Aaron just wants everyone to know that the slides are up on SCED. I'm going to go ahead and turn off the recording because I'm very mindful of the time and thanks to everyone who's hung in there. But do stick around if you have more questions or comments for Aaron and Tony, um, please stick around, raise your hand, I'll be happy to unmute you. And with, with that, I will just wish everyone a good rest of their day. Be safe and be well, bye-bye.